be hard to create the political environment for them to change course without dragging Israel in. Now, whether or not you want to say that Israel's uh, acquiring nuclear weapons is equivalent to Iran's worst, better, whatever, that to me is not the point as far as real politics is concerned. How are you going to get that change to occur without incorporating Israel into the conversation? That's Christopher, the uh, just a, a, I'd like to sort of put a line under this, but I just want to ask you one question and a brief answer if you, can, if you could. Um, you mean I'm incapable of a brief answer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be terse if I have to be. OK, we'll answer this tersely. Um, Israel, of course, uh, did try and stop uh, Iraq uh, acquiring nuclear weapons by bombing a reactor. Uh, would it be justified, in your opinion, for them to do the same uh, in Iran? What Israel did to the Assyriac reactor was what the Iranians had tried to do. Everyone forgets this uh, with their own air force a couple of months before. The Iranians had a huge sigh of relief when the Israelis pulled off a raid they couldn't bring off themselves and disarmed Saddam Hussein. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in the Sunni Arab world, believe you me, who hope that the Israelis take out the, the Iranian one in turn. But they can't say so in public any more than the Iranians could before. My own view is that Israel both cannot and should not no. uh, attempt uh, such an attack. OK, well, we're going to move on again. Um, well, actually, look, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm going to take your question, you. lady in the front there. <laughs> look, my one question is basically, or my one comment, or passing comment, is that so many times you've brought up women in Islam. I'd just like to correct that I've read the Quran, and all Muslim scholars would agree with me that Islam gives women a lot of rights. We over and over give Islam, women in Islam through the Quran, I may not say it through individuals who preach the religion, but Islam through the Quran gives women a lot of rights and I need that to be heard. I need it to, to have everyone to understand and hear that. I mean, Absolutely. I am a young Muslim woman myself. I sit before you, I have a voice and I can speak to you and I can look you in the eye. And I do have my rights. And when I go to Iran, I'm actually Iranian as well. So when I go to Iran, I also have my rights. I need it to be heard that the Quran, the Quran, Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, gives us our rights. In people, individuals in countries and people who represent our religion may not and they may do the wrong thing to um, sort of stand in front and show us religion and preach us religion, but Islam does. All right. We're going to take that as a comment, a very passionate one at that. OK. No, no. You're, uh, hey, no, no, we're not. No, we're not going to take it as a comment. I can, I can see your face, I can see your hair, and I can see you sitting in an audience with young gentlemen. Don't you tell me you can do any of that in Iran. I can, though. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you cannot. I can in Iran. <laughs> in Iran, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where I have you been, could, my I hair would see your be hair. out. My yep. hair would be out because my veil would be little. My hair would be out. It may be covered a little bit, but just like in, in, oh, in the on. Bible, in the letter to the Corinthians, okay. Okay. it says to cover your no, hair no. to be modest. It's a shame she spoiled what could be the perfectly be. good state. Oh, all right, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Would be there. I mean, you've been talking about these cheap, uh, cheap jokes and things throughout have, this if, whole if conversation, you but you're the only one you making insult, the cheap you comments. Insult, you insult your sisters in Tehran who are being beaten, who are being beaten and raped Allah every Allah day when you say not, that they have I their rights in the Islamic Muslim Republic. Sisters, you, it's an insult to the women of Iran. I do not. Okay. Okay. We're nearly out of time. You're watching Q&A live. If you'd like to join the audience, uh, register on our website. The address is on your screen, abc.net.au slash Q&A. We have one last question. It comes from Pam Collicott. Many non-believers facing death change their minds about religion. Is that fear or comfort? OK, we're going to have to have quick answers from everybody. Frank Brennan. It's often both. <laughs> Henderson. I would say exactly the same. It's again what I said before, where there is no meaning, people find, find God. And they, that's their comfort. There's even supposed to be a God gene, I think someone thought of. And I don't understand it totally, and some part of me does, so you know, I would say I agree with Frank. It's fear and comfort. Wally Dully. Well, let's not ignore it. It's a perfectly rational decision to make at that point. <laughs> 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 When you're on your deathbed, there's absolutely no point not believing in God at that point. Because uh, you might be right. You may as well jump on a team that, if it's wrong, who cares? You know? I, would, so, I would say God knows. I mean, you know, unless you're from a team that, you know, dies repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, there, uh, you... When Voltaire was dying, the priest came and said, you should renounce the devil, and he said, this is no time to be making enemies. <laughs> But it's a, it's a, it's a religious uh, falsification that uh, people like myself scream for a priest at the end. David Hume very famously didn't, didn't and was witnessed by, by James Boswell not doing so. Uh, most of us go to our ends with dignity. If we don't, and if it is 
of the wish for fear or comfort, then both of these things are equally delusory, as religion is itself. And uh, I think what we've... Thank you. We've, uh, we've proven, I think, tonight that this kind of discussion is worth having, but that is all we have time for. I'm sorry to those people who still got their hands up. Please thank our panellists, Frank Brennan, Christopher Hitchens, Sally Warhart, Wally Daly and Anne Henderson. All right. Next week. Next week, another iconoclastic panel, including the feminist author with dangerous ideas, Jermaine Greer, Gruen Transfer, Adman Todd Sampson, the Labour Party's Belinda Neal, and uh, the Liberal Party backbench rebel Corey Bernardi. Uh, that's all we have at the moment. We'll have one more by then. Uh, so join us next Thursday for another great Q&A. Good night.